European countries had historically fought themselves into the ground and been left weak and vulnerable to other enemies. And many Europeans hoped the South would win the American War between the states so they could bring some kings and queens across the ocean, and that would lend some social grace to the uncouth Americans. Jefferson and Davis had especially liked that idea, and so the Europeans had waited like vultures for America to wear itself out in the war between the states, but just the opposite happened. The tradition in Europe had been to force people to fight, but the Americans pitched in to the last person, and Americans fought furiously for themselves and their own destiny. And instead of bleeding the treasury dry, America was actually strengthened by the war that made industry boom. People traveled during the war, and money followed the fighting. And the American economy emerged even stronger after the war due to the unlimited business opportunities that had been created by the upheaval. For his adventure in Mexico, Max had ordered the Order of the Mexican Eagle had invented the Order of the Mexican Eagle and awarded twelve grand crosses with collar and twenty-five grand crosses, and he appointed one hundred commanders and two hundred officers and bestowed an unlimited number of knighthoods, and Carly started the Order of San Carlos after her patron saint, and she passed out medals like candy. State dinners began at 3.30 p.m. and ended five or six hours later, the wine bill alone for Chapultepec, Chapultepec in 1865 amounted to more than 100,000 pesos, with whole regiments of French, Rhenish, and Hungarian wines being brought up from the cellar and expended against the Mexican thirst. The Cactus Throne, page 148 and 9. Max wrote in his diary, quote, the diplomats gorge and swill to such an extent that as a rule after dinner they can only mumble inarticulate sounds, close quote. The Cactus Throne, page 149 and 50. Carly thought the locals were lazy and worthless, and her plan was to get enough Europeans to come over so that Mexico could be cured of its lethargy, and she saw Mexico as becoming more like America after having defeated the warring Indians. Juarez was a native Indian from Oaxaca whose tribe called themselves the Cloud People, and Oaxaca was on the Pacific side from Veracruz where the Mexican peninsula narrowed to allow transit to the Pacific from the Gulf of Mexico, and in English the name Juaristas sounded exactly like Waristas. Juarez wanted to get rid of all the rich Spanish landowners, and he especially wanted to put an end to the rich people's right hand, the Catholic Church. And Carly and Max were abidingly faithful Catholics. Carly wrote to her mother that the Church kept everybody in its power by keeping them poor and illiterate, and Max and Carly had been married for nine years in 1866 and were still without children, and the Church was spreading the rumor that Max had picked up a venereal disease in the Navy. By April of 1867, 30,000 French soldiers had left Mexico because they were no longer being paid, and Max had moved out of the palace because he couldn't find any decent servants, and he had moved into the, into the Hacienda of the Teja, an abandoned estate in Cuernavaca that was a lovely tropical paradise, and as Max daydreamed in his hammock, shaded by orange and mango trees, Carly wandered among the flowers. To subdue the turmoil that was Mexico in October of 1865, Max had given his black decree that said all Mexicans taking up arms against the government would be shot under martial law, and that had resulted in the execution of over 10,000 Mexicans. There had been 5,000 Austrian and Belgian soldiers that were supposed to be defending Max, but instead the Europeans melted away and fled the country in 1867, and Juarez surrounded Max's palace and opened fire while Max stood out in the middle of the Plaza of the Cross because he thought it was his duty. <laughs> 
The story was that Juarez had given Max two clear chances to escape, but Max had insisted on proving the Juarista army to be no more than bandits by facing their firing squad without a fair trial, and he was shot wearing the Order of the Golden Fleece. They didn't kill him well enough the first time, so they had to shoot him again, even though Max had paid them extra money to aim for his heart. But instead they shot him in the face, although they did manage to kill the two generals on either side of him right away. And they shot Max in the face to warn the Europeans never to come over to Mexico again. When Max was murdered, the Mexican military raided his mailbox and stole a sizable amount of British money and fled to Cuba. And the rich people who'd been living off Max followed these deserters to Cuba and used the stolen British money to turn that island into a very nice place. Juarez had been disgusted that America didn't murder all the southern rebels after winning the war between the states. And Juarez turned to fighting with the U.S., while the rest of the world didn't want to have anything to do with Mexico. The Juaristas thought it was important to ship Max's body home, but his face had been badly damaged, so they put artificial eyes in Max but didn't have any blue ones, so they used the black eyeballs from a statue of the Virgin Mary. The Mexicans had kept the body for four months so everyone could look at him, and they put a little window in the coffin for the display, but the embalming fluid was not good enough and the corpse turned dark. When the body reached Vienna, his family put two hundred candles in ornate silver holders around the coffin so the Austrians could see what the Mexicans had done to Max. The next year in Mexico, there was a memorial service for Max, so Juarez had the chapel destroyed, and Juarez would die of a heart attack a few years later, and Mexico continued to be its usual continual dogfight. Carly lived for another seventy years, but was never the same after the death of her husband. And her brother Leopold, too, refused to let her live in the palace, but locked her up in the castle of the beauty of the sleeping wood that had been built in 1173 during the days of the Crusades. The castle was being used as storage for all the stuff collected from the good old days, and Carly lived amidst tons of suits of armor and ancient weapons and tapestries and portraits from the days of Charlemagne, and she had seizures from loud noises, and they had to remove the doorknobs in the castle. They buried Max in the church of the Capuchins at Abraham a Santa Clara, and they didn't let any Mexicans come to the funeral and they also didn't invite the French, and Max was buried in the basement next to the eaglet. The year after the Seven Weeks' War that took Hanover away from Austria and gave it to Prussia, the Prussians began helping Hungary to build up a military in 1867, and the Austrians and the Hungarians had been struggling with each other for a very long time. Mexico would continue to suffer from general banditry conducted mostly by the established military. And in 1894, Pancho Villa's 12-year-old sister was raped by their landlord the same year Mexico's President Diaz announced that Mexico had finally balanced its budget by selling the Yaqui Indians into plantation slavery and giving away all Mexico's oil rights and most of Mexico's mines to foreigners. Mexico had been free from Spain for 70 years, and of the 10 million Mexicans, there were 9.5 million of them who owned no land, and all the police were nothing but murderers. Pancho Villa was arrested by Diaz in 1902 for stealing mules and was forced into the army instead of being kept in jail. And Pancho did some active fighting for Huerta, but Pancho deserted a few months later, and Huerta put him back in jail when Pancho stole a horse. While he was in jail, Pancho learned how to read, using a copy of The, the Three Musketeers, and he would always be in trouble thereafter chasing women. Mexican prisoners had not been allowed to have private visits from their wives or girlfriends. Oh, Mexican prisoners had been allowed to have private visits from their wives or girlfriends, and Pancho had both. And Pancho was 25 years old before he could write his own name. And because the church no longer ran the schools, there weren't any schools at all. <laughs>
Huerta came up with a good constitution, but the Mexican people couldn't read, so he had murals painted to explain the new civil rules. And Huerta gave away land, but the people didn't have enough tools or seeds or water. And while the president was a good person, everyone else in the government was a hopeless cheat. While Huerta was busy with his land reforms, Pancho escaped from jail and went to El Paso, Texas, where a Scot named Benton owned a ranch in Chihuahua and demanded that Pancho hang for stealing his cattle, so Pancho had him killed. Pancho's friends didn't want to waste a bullet, so they just whacked the Scot on the back of the head with a shovel, and Pancho insisted the Scot had been shot, but when the body was dug up, they found out that Pancho was not just a murderer, but he was also a liar. Diaz resigned in 1911, and the situation in Mexico was grim. So the U.S. gave Pancho a sizable stash of guns because Pancho told them that he would protect America's southern border from foreigners. And Pancho went back to Mexico and joined Zapata's revolution against Huerta. Pancho stole cattle and robbed trains starting with a Wells Fargo train, and then went on to rob even more trains, and he would pillage private haciendas. John Reed, the journalist, sought him out and lived with Pancho for four months and glamorized him as a Robin Hood, and Hollywood wanted to pay Pancho to make movies. Huerta was chased out of Mexico City by Pancho's rebels in 1914, and he had to flee from the same palace that Max and Carly had used and Pancho's army began a bloody civil war, but unfortunately for Pancho, he'd run out of wealthy people to rob. The government still held the ports of Veracruz and Tamaulipas, Tamaulipas, so Pancho was chased out of Mexico City in 1915 and fled to the hills to hide out. Pancho would come down from his hideouts to rob and pillage, but suffered many defeats and desertions until he had only 200 men left. And without any more help from his American friends, Pancho was just a cattle thief and a train robber. Some Americans were shot in his crossfire, so the U.S. decided to go after Pancho, and Lieutenant Patton answered the call to help capture Pancho Villa. Patton served as General Blackjack Pershing's aide-de-camp, and the story was that Patton had acquired his ivory-handled Colt revolver. His ivory-handled Colt revolver at the time in a Mexican saloon. Patton led the first-ever motorized attack force against Pancho's men on the 14th of May in 1916, and he attacked with 12 Americans in three Dodge touring cars and killed three of Pancho's bandits, and Patton was promoted to captain one year later and sent to Europe in May of 1917 to train American soldiers for the Great War. Patton was sent to Paris until the 10th of November of 1917, and he commanded an American base 120 miles west of Strasbourg. And Patton was sent to a French tank training school where he got to drive a Renault FT-17 with a fully rotating turret and a water-cooled engine with a magneto starter. The FT-17 had four speeds forward and one in reverse and the tracks were independent, independently controlled for steering, and Patton was shown the tank factory that was 40 miles outside Paris. On the 26th of January in 1918, Patton was promoted to major and given 10 tanks, and Patton personally backed seven of them off the train, and Patton trained men and used tanks in combat in the Great War. Patton was wounded by machine gun fire 50 miles west of Metz, and after the Great War he trained tank soldiers to use tanks as independent assault vehicles rather than just for infantry support. The pursuit of Pancho Villa had been a prime training ground for preparing the American army to go over to France in 1917, and in Mexico Pershing had sent trucks by rail car and used almost 10,000 soldiers with machine guns in the Pancho Villa training exercise, and they had also used aerial reconnaissance with wireless radios for the first time. <laughs>
Huerta had been the general president of Mexico while Pancho was ripping and running. And Huerta was also a monster who spent most of his time in bars and had once machine-gunned a crowd of protesters, killing 100 people. And one historian said that Mexico was simply one grand dogfight. The American ambassador said this was all very normal for Mexico, so President Wilson had the ambassador fired. And Huerto had not only put many people in jail, he dissolved the Senate and had a senator from Chiapas killed for writing a pamphlet critical of Huerta. After Mexico had won its independence from Spain in 1821, it had been unable to compete with the American trade coming down the Santa Fe Trail. And Mexico had gone downhill from there until most Americans believed that bringing a new government to Mexico would be doing it a favor. Huerta had threatened to invade Texas and get all the Americans of African descent to march on Washington. And when the U.S. Navy sent ships to protect American oil refineries in Mexico, a German steamer arrived full of guns and ammunition intended for Huerta, and the Americans seized Veracruz to keep the Germans out, killing several hundred Mexicans with only a few American lives lost. With help from Germany, Huerta had almost seized back control of Mexico, but his liver would fail first, and after finally choosing sides, the U.S. sent searchlights to Huerto, Huerta to keep Pancho from prevailing in his night raids. Pancho made the fatal mistake of attacking a train in January of 1916 that killed 17 Americans aboard the train, and Pancho rode away with enough booty to hire 300 more men and began raiding ranches on American soil, since there was nothing left to rob in Chihuahua territory. His first raid in America was in the town of Columbus, New Mexico, and soon after that, Pancho attacked the U.S. 13th Cavalry Regiment in March of 1916 and stole 100 horses, along with plenty of military supplies, and in that raid, he killed 18 Americans and 100 civilians. For the next three months, Pancho's bandits hit three more towns in Texas and continued the robbing and the murdering, so President Wilson sent U.S. soldiers to hunt Pancho down, and the Americans killed several hundred of Pancho's men, but he escaped when the local Mexicans helped him hide out. At this point, Germany offered to help Pancho, and that included the Zimmerman telegram, but Pancho refused them, even though both Pancho and the Mexican government were using Mauser rifles and could have used the German resupply. After all the fighting, Mexico was in shambles with the refineries destroyed and the cattle and the crops ruined or sold to keep the army fighting. And Mexico was already suffering when the flu of 1919 hit, which quickly spread with all the hungry and homeless and wounded Mexicans on the move and a million and a half Mexicans would die of the flu in 1919. The following year, the new president of Mexico gave Pancho a 25,000-acre ranch and a half million gold pesos if he would agree to stop fighting and become a good farmer. And Pancho lived on his ranch with his remaining 200 soldiers, but he kept three quote-unquote wives. Wives in different towns and the tension between them had something to do with Pancho being murdered three years later. In 1923, Pancho was coming back to his ranch from the bank in the city after picking up the monthly payroll, payroll for his men, and he was ambushed in a robbery while driving his 1919 Dodge touring car, and his, his estate was surrounded after the telegraph wires to his compound were cut and the government seized his property and thousands of people would show up for Pancho's funeral. Max's older brother, Franz Josef, had died in November of 1916 at the age of 86 after catching pneumonia from walking in the park with the last king of Bavaria who had taken a bullet in the thigh during the Seven Weeks' War in 1866. And then Bavaria had sided with Prussia instead of Austria in 1870 for the Franco-Prussian War that united Germany, thanks to Bismarck. 
and Austria had stayed out of the Franco-Prussian War because the Austrians no longer trusted the French after what had happened to Max in Mexico. Hitler planned to give Arizona, New Mexico, and Texas back to Mexico if they helped Germany, but even that wouldn't have done him much good because Britain was much better at playing for empire, and Abraham Lincoln was right about needing a country large enough to keep the British at bay. <clears throat> I had tea, which was French for champagne, one afternoon with Madame Pomeroy. She talked very fast and hard and savagely. She hardly let me get a word in etchwise. I thought at the time, this is the way Hitler harangues unfriendly journalists. In a high, shrill voice she damned old Uncle Shylock and cried out after the last war America, clamoring for war debts, had made poor France danser comme une femme entre tenue, dance like a kept woman. And when I said quickly, you didn't dance long, she replied, Accoutez, ma petite, when your Monsieur Hoover relieved Germany of reparations, France was left holding the basket. Why is it strong for us to collect money from Germany for the rebuilding of our homes and factories, destroyed by German invasion, but right for you to collect from us? who had destroyed nothing of yours but made you rich as Croesus. Now, as for our war aims, she went on, although they are none of America's business, I'll tell you this. We have already achieved one of them. We have destroyed communism in France forever! Exclamation point. Europe in the Spring, page 98-9. to nine. On the 18th of May... In 1917, America started drafting military men, and two million American soldiers went overseas with the first Liberty loan of two billion dollars at three and a half percent interest, and the House Revenue Bill of 1918 would issue Liberty bonds for six billion that fall. In July of 1917, Britain cabled the U.S. Treasury to say that Britain would be unable to pay any more of its debts, and at that time they owed the U.S. over four billion dollars. So America had to go over to fight the damn war so England would survive enough to be able to pay back the U.S. Treasury. Britain told America that they only had six weeks of food left, so the U.S. sent convoys to keep the English from starving and losing the war and defaulting on its debt to the U.S. Treasury and Uncle Sam would sell a grand total of $21 billion worth of Liberty Bonds to American taxpayers for the Great War, mostly sold by volunteers. The British and Germans had been in a Mexican standoff in the trenches, but German U-boats started winning the war for Germany, and there was no doubt that within a year England would be forced to surrender so the Americans improved on the depth charges that the British had been experimenting with, and that put the German U-boats out of business. After the Great War, Italy owed America over $2 billion, and the French owed $4 billion, and they were all given 62 years to pay, and by 1934 they had all stopped making payments, except for Finland. By 1918, Herbert Hoover had become the director of the Belgian Relief Commission, where his job was to distribute food to a starving Belgium after the Great War. And Hoover didn't just give food away, but brought them, quote, intelligent economic assistance, close quote, and he bartered train, train engines for eggs, and he also took personal IOUs. Hoover fought with Churchill about the food program, and Hoover made many British enemies, because Churchill insisted that Germany be left to starve. But Hoover strongly disagreed, and after the war, Britain bought food from Argentina and Australia rather than buying from America, leaving American farmers with a considerable amount of overproduction. Hoover had to fight with the bleeding heart French who thought people had a right to food without working for it and the French promised to broadcast Hoover's plan from the Eiffel Tower, but they kept putting it off indefinitely. The fact that most of the ships belonging to the Allies were at the bottom of the ocean saved 
Hoover's food program because France, England, and Germany were all short on boats, so they had to buy from American shipping companies, who delivered two billion dollars worth of food to Europe. Churchill wanted the Germans to be burdened with feeding Belgium, but Hoover overrode him while England continued to receive the lion's share of food relief. And Hoover wasn't as worried about Germany because they were getting countless food packages in the mail from relatives living in Milwaukee and in St. Louis. The other European countries were getting even more food in the mail from their relatives in America than the Germans, but many American charities were anti-German and Hoover had to do an end run around them. During the Great War, Hoover said he quit riding the bus because old women would poke him with their umbrellas, asking why he wasn't in uniform. Hoover had been raised a Quaker and was not religiously inclined to be a soldier. So instead, Hoover was put in charge of the U.S. Food Administration Grain Corporation to determine the price and the profits and the licenses and organization of the shipping and milling and sale of wheat. Hoover did not control the price of food by force, but made his agency the main buyer and seller. And by the end of the Great War, three times as much wheat was being grown in America as before the war, and thanks to Hoover, infant mortality in Belgium was lower during the war than before the hostilities began. As the head of the Food Administration, Hoover actually made money for the U.S. government by keeping overhead costs at one half of one percent, and Hoover had gone to Berlin during the war to get the Kaiser to tell Governor General Baron von Bissing to cooperate with Hoover's food program in Belgium, and Hoover watched the Battle of the Somme through the binoculars of a German officer. Young Herbert Hart Clark Hoover Young Herbert Clark Hoover had studied science and gotten a degree in geology, and Hoover went to China in 1899 to manage a British mine where the only oriental manager familiar with the mine got up daily at noon and smoked opium until weak and pale. Herbert Hoover, A Public Life by David Berner, New York, Alfred A. Knopf, 1979, page 35. One of Hoover's Chinese friends would later become the premier of China, and Hoover had been in China for a year when the Boxer Rebellion broke out in 1900, and he watched 1,500 soldiers from different Western countries fight off tens of thousands of Chinese peasants d determined to chase them out. Hundreds of Westerners died while Hoover said he saw 2,000 bodies float down the river and all of the foreign devils would have perished except that 700 Russian soldiers had come to their rescue. After his years in China, Hoover went to South Africa and improved the miserable working conditions of the shiploads of coolie labor being brought in, and Hoover was not only a good engineer at working mines, but he was also an expert at managing money and Hoover was employed from Nigerian tin mines to Canadian gold to Egyptian turquoise mining, and he would become the first American president who was born west of the Mississippi. His rise to the directorship of mining companies was a Veblenian event, for previously these positions had usually gone to retired military gentlemen, picked for the dignity they could lend to the office rather than for their technical or even financial knowledge. Hoover, A Public Life, page 64. In 1912, the Russian Tsar asked Hoover to survey mines in eastern Siberia, and Hoover added reports on how to improve the conditions in Russia's prison camps and Hoover brought engineers from Montana to dig for copper and gold in the Ural Mountains and worked mines all over the world, but was not allowed to work any mines on British territory. All Hoover's work records were burned up in the Russian Revolution, and then he worked with Lyndon Bates on the east coast of the Black Sea, looking for oil until Bates lost his mind when his son died on the Titanic. Emboldened by the anti-German sentiment after the Great War, Britain started seizing every German boat they could find for quote-unquote reparations, and Germany began to suffer. In 
and while the French and Belgians gave Hoover their highest medal after the Great War for his food program, Britain refused to honor him. Hoover knew that getting food into Austria and Hungary would keep the Emperor Franz from wanting to continue the war, and Hoover knew that bread is mightier than the sword, and that after the war people would want to return to private life instead of propping up their former emperor. Recently historians have come down hard on Hoover for not feeding Hungary during the period, but the American Relief Administration had estimated Hungary's food needs as far less pressing than those of neighboring countries such as Austria. So no ARA feeding of Hungary had occurred, and the country had actually exported some food. Hoover told a congressional committee sitting in Paris that with food in Serbia sixty miles south and in Romania eighty miles east, the United States should not send shipments from four thousand miles distant. Hoover, A Public Life, page 122. The Hungarians took advantage of the situation and sided with the Soviets, and when Hoover chased the communists out of Hungary, the British tried to put Franz back on the throne behind Hoover's back, but on his own and all by himself, Hoover managed to convince everyone that Franz was now obsolete. Hoover sent a telegram to Franz, saying it was unacceptable for him to even allow his former empire to elect him democratically, and Hoover let the emperor know that the rule of the Austrian Empire had come to an end. Hoover knew that socialism only worked during wartime, that people would want to take care of their own families instead of having any contact with the government after the fighting had stopped. <clears throat> and Hoover also knew that the Russian Revolution had begun as a simple food riot. Italy wanted money for shipping food out of Trieste, so Hoover sent food to Italy instead, completely wiping out the Italians' profits. And then Yugoslavia stopped sending food to Serbia, so Hoover cut off food to Yugoslavia while the Russian peasants ate one of Hoover's workers. Hoover warned everyone not to fight the Russian Reds and said that communism would fail all by itself and that fighting them would only give them a reason to unify and strengthen, strengthen, which is exactly what happened. And fighting the Red Russians had been a British idea as they sent the White Armies into Russia to fight the Reds and the Greens before the Great War had even grown cold. Britain had planned for America to do the fighting in the war with the Whites, but instead Hoover was elected the President of the United States. Hoover knew that sending soldiers to stop communism <clears throat> only propped up the quote-unquote democratic aristocracy and made people want communism even more, and Europeans were not sending so much stuff to Russia because they barely had enough for themselves. And Hoover wanted to do in Russia what he, what he had done in Belgium, working with the communists as he had worked with the Germans. In America, there had been few jobs available when soldiers returned from the Great War, and people who'd been working at wartime wages wanted to keep making the same amount of money, and the returning soldiers found out that the people who'd stayed home from the war made more money than the ones who had gone off to fight, so the returning troops wanted Congress to give them bonuses early to make up for the difference. For lack of useful work, a contingent of soldiers well trained in the Great War hopped on freight trains and headed for Washington, D.C., to see if Hoover would give them their bonuses that weren't due until 1945. But what they didn't know was that the government couldn't afford it, and they got as far as Missouri before trouble broke out, and it was called the Battle of East St. Louis. One quarter of the national budget was already going to the new Veterans Administration and other benefits for Great War veterans, but Hoover had held back from giving the American Legion, Legion their Council of National Defense they wanted so they could march and drill with weapons. Hoover thought the soldiers' contingent were peaceful people and provided them with food and tents and clothing, and Hoover allowed the campers to picket and protest, but then some provocateurs and communist agitators showed up and turned it into a bloody fight. The former soldiers had been camping for over three weeks without trouble, 
and had pretty well reconciled themselves to having to wait for their bonuses, but the provocateurs talked them into occupying some abandoned government buildings, contrary to the rules of the camp-out, and when the government ordered them to leave, a riot broke out, and eight hundred police officers fought five thousand former soldiers, and tear gas and sabers were used, and two people died. MacArthur was on duty that day, along with Patton and Eisenhower, and MacArthur stopped the fight in time for his men to eat dinner. But then the campsite burned down, and while some claimed the campers had set the fire themselves, others said it had been an accident, and the British press had a field day. Britain was blaming America for the failure of the Whites to defeat the Reds in Russia. And the last gasp of British hegemony, hegemony, in Central Asia was dying, just as the Islamist Basmachi uprising finally joined with the Soviets in Turkestan. British agents continued to stir up the Moslems on the border with Afghanistan <clears throat> in pursuance of their great game, and the point of the great game was to protect British interests in India, and in so doing, they used the Moslems to keep Russia away from India's borders. The more the Islamists were incited against Mother Russia, the more the Russians were forced to quell the Moslems, and by 1932 the British were losing the great game, despite their best efforts, so the British press went to work to stop Hoover from being re-elected because Hoover was dead set against sending American soldiers to fight Russians. The bonus marchers were given plenty of media coverage in July of 1932, and three months later Hoover lost his re-election to the Democrat FDR, who turned out not only to be another patriot, but also a friend of Mother Russia. Of course, the British had lost the Great War <clears throat> when the Russians went Soviet and abandoned their trenches in the East, and that had allowed Germany to turn its full attention to the Western Front, and had the war been allowed to continue just a little longer, Germany would have emerged the clear winners, and the Germans knew it. However, the flu had already begun to put an end to the Great War the previous spring, and perhaps perhaps brought in by the 100,000 Chinese laborers imported to the Western Front by the British the year before, shipped in to work behind the lines. But by the end of summer in 1918, there would be no more doubt that the flu was going to win the war. In the end, a half billion people came down with the Spanish flu by the end of 1920, and 100 million of them died, not so much from the flu itself, but from superinfection in weakened people due to conditions that were a direct result of the war. Newspapers in Spain <clears throat> had been the only ones not censoring news about the flu while everyone else was saying such stories were deleterious to the war effort, so people thought the flu had originated with the Spanish and called it the Spanish flu. The disease had a mortality rate of 20% and spared no country on the entire planet, with the exception of a couple desert islands. And the first wave had hit in the spring of 1918 and had somewhat receded by summer but came back ten times as strong in September and the war would end with the armistice ten weeks later. Those who had recovered from the first wave had an immunity to the second wave, proving that it was a similar strain, and as soldiers returned from the battlefield and refugees returned to their home towns, the flu traveled along with them and the steam shovels that had been used to dig the Panama Canal were put to use burying the dead in September and October of 1918. While the flu had largely died out by November of 1918, the legal papers for the armistice had already been drawn up despite fresh wind luffing the sails of the war planners. And, of course, the British press had been blaming the Americans for the origin of the flu, even reporting that it had been spread by canned meat made in America. The U.S. Army had documented the arrival of the flu in America from a ship docking in Boston on the 27th of August in 1918, and within ten days, the base hospital and regimental infirmaries had been overwhelmed with thousands of sick 
trainees. The flu would return in January of 1919, but was less severe, although it spread more widely with the demobilization. And after the war in America, things had been grim for a year or so until everybody got used to peace again, and found something to do, and as soon as they made up their minds to make things better, it started to get really good. <clears throat> Henry Ford had gone to Norway on a peace expedition in 1915, but found out that Europe was nothing like America, and Ford realized that the Great War was unstoppable. Henry Ford thought that giving tractors to Europe would help them fight their war because it would at least help them with the food shortages. And while in England, Ford bought Anne Boleyn's old house, but he never lived there, although it gave him an excuse to build factories in, Le in England for making his tractors, and Henry Ford thought there was more money to be made in manufacturing tractors than in making war machinery. American farmers went nuts over Ford's tractors and plowed their fields into fine powder, thinking the loose dirt, dirt would hold more water, but instead it just blew away in the dust bowl. As dust storms made farming impossible, industrial accidents between tractors and children became less frequent, and farmers packed up their motor vehicles and headed west to California, using American ingenuity to keep the vehicles moving with baling wire and chewing gum and cannibalized parts, and this practicing with their mechanical skills would later win Hitler's war for America. <clears throat> The labor camps springing up in California were not unique, and were described in Steinbeck's book published in 1939 called The Grapes of Wrath, and the government thought that Steinbeck's book The Grapes of Wrath was communist propaganda, and the town fathers burned the book in front of the library, and Steinbeck received death threats. Nobody would rent John Steinbeck an office in Monterey, and the city wouldn't supply him with gas and people would cross the street to avoid him, and Kenneth Jackson said that the Grapes of Wrath movie that came out in 1940 was shown all over Russia as an example of how bad things were in America, but instead the Russian people were very impressed that all the poor Americans had cars. British car makers had worried about Germany invading their island, so they designed cars for driving on the opposite side of the road, thinking Germans would stand out as they drove the wrong way <clears throat> on the wrong side of the roadway. And the British also came up with a gauge of tools called Whitworth that were a different size than those used outside England, and that way invading Germans wouldn't be able to fix their cars. Unfortunately for Britain, everyone wanted cars with the passengers sitting on the right side, so the British car industry languished, while few English could afford to buy them anyway. When cars first came out, people didn't want to have anything to do with the newfangled contraptions, and farmers claimed to have no need for cars because there were plenty of motorcycles around, but Americans subject to city living wanted cars because without farm work to keep them fit, many Americans had become too unhealthy to ride motorcycles, and they also wanted to stay out of the rain. The first car with an internal combustion engine had been invented in Germany by Nicholas Otto in 1876, and then Gottlieb Daimler, Daimler and Carl Benz built automobiles that were shown at the 1882 Paris Exposition, along with Otto's new car. The diesel engine was invented by a German named Rudolf Diesel, who was born while his parents were living in Paris and Rudolf had spent his childhood hanging out at the Paris Museum, and when France and Germany went to war in 1870, Rudolf Diesel's family moved to London, where he hung out at the Science Museum, and then Rudolf went to school in Germany and studied under the man who had re invented refrigeration, whose name was Karl von Linde. Rudolf made a great deal of money assembling his diesel engines, but Rudolph disappeared on his way to sell diesels to the British military in 1913, and he'd been on a boat when he vanished, and some people said he was thrown overboard by German spies, but the British said that he'd committed suicide. <clears throat> 
Henry Ford had been born in the third year of the American War between the States, and his mother was an immigrant from Belgium, and Ford's father was English, but had moved to Ireland and then come to America with the big migration of 1847. Young Henry Ford hated being on the farm when he was a child, and he wanted to make cars for people so they could drive away from their farms. Henry Ford started the Ford Motor Company the same year as the world's first flight in 1903, and the automobile was showcased at the 1904 World's Fair, and the majority of Ford's engineers had come from Germany. Once Henry Ford asked Steinmetz to work out the wrinkles in the new generator at Ford's River Rouge plant. On arrival, Steinmetz refused all assistance, walked around the generator, humming to himself, asked for a piece of chalk, then climbed the ladder and drew a mark on the side of the generator. He then told Ford's men to remove the plate which he had marked and take exactly sixteen windings from the coil. The generator then worked perfectly, and Steinmetz set Ford a bill for ten thousand dollars. Ford replied with a request for an itemized statement. Steinmetz complied with two items. Making chalk mark on generator, one dollar. Knowing where to make chalk mark, nine thousand nine hundred ninety-nine dollars. The German-Americans, page 373. Cars were used as portable bedrooms by young people and cars were also great for making escapes during prohibition raids because they could carry away the contraband and those who didn't own cars saw them bouncing through their front yards and pastures on picnics cars would frighten horses and livestock so both people and animals were injured in their wake and within one decade people were no longer isolated on self-sustaining family farms in eighteen nineteen a blind scotsman named Macadam had come up with a way to make roads by placing big rocks along a path and piling smaller and smaller stones on top and packing them down. And many of these macadam roads remain roadworthy to this day. In 1912, Carl Fisher proposed building a rock highway made of cement and Carl was the owner of the Prestolite Headlamp Company, and he was able to borrow money from the Sieberling and Goodyear Tire Companies to build his highway. Carl Fisher bought millions of barrels of Portland cement to build, begin construction of a real roadway, and he had the blessing and encouragement of Uncle Sam, and Thomas Edison owned Portland cement. Firestone, Ford, and Edison were friends who spoke on radio talk shows about the virtue of hard work, even though Edison was too deaf to hear any of it. And they would go on camping trips together with the naturalist John Burroughs, and even President Harding came on one of their camping trips with them. Roads <clears throat> roads were first built for the military, and in peacetime the American government wanted people to buy Ford cars that would improve commerce, so instead of any company having to build private roads, American tax dollars went towards road construction so the automobile industry would boost the economy. The Great War interfered with the construction of the highways, and during the war the military had commandeered all the trains and driving for fun was outlawed with gasoline strictly rationed, so life was grim during the war under martial law on the home front. Henry Ford accepted a huge government contract in 1917 to build a factory on the Rouge River for building Eagle submarine fighters, and he also had contracts to build mass-produced Liberty engines, and Ford had produced seven boats when the Army ordered 15,000 Ford tanks, but before he could tool up, the armistice was signed. In 1920, 20 million more people died of the flu and a half a million of them in America, twice as many as had died in battle. And Henry Ford's mass production lines made up for the lack of skilled hands available for work. <laughs>
Henry Ford had ideas about other things than designing of motors, carburetors, magnetos, jigs and fixtures, punches and dies. He had ideas about sales, that the big money was in economical quantity production, quick turnover, cheap, interchangeable, easily replaced, standardized parts. It wasn't until 1909, after years of arguing with his partners, that Ford put out the first Model T. Henry Ford was right. That season he sold more than 10,000 tin lizzies. Ten years later he was selling almost a million a year. The big money. Page 52 and 3. Electricity made the work of one pair of hands even better. So higher wages could be paid to workers, although the improvement of electricity put many others out of work. Skilled workers joined unions, and President Hoover sided with the labor unions because he knew that a company could only be successful when the workers were well fed and workplace safety was upheld. Mass production was a gift to the world where before only skilled workers needed to apply, and the first Tin Lizzie built in 1908 had taken 14 hours to make one car, while the assembly line cut that to an hour and a half. And Henry Ford said his idea for mass production had come from watching the butchering factories in Chicago. Ford thought the unions were run by Jews, and he offered non-union workers five dollars a day to build tin lizzies. And before the five-dollar day, four people would quit for every person who stayed. And after the five-dollar day, two would stay for every person who quit. And by 1914, a quarter million Model Ts were out on the roads of America. The Model T cost $850 in 1908, and that dropped to $600 by 1912. Then a Model T cost only $360 in 1916, and half a million had been made. Henry Ford was the first to offer payments on the installment plan, but many farmers couldn't keep up with the payments because so few had regular jobs and their cars would be repossessed without any credit on how much they'd already invested, so word got out about the repossession policies and people started to hesitate about buying Ford cars. Ford reminded them that his motto was to never make obsolete a car that had already been sold, which meant that his cars could be fixed or repaired daily by a quick trip into town for spare parts, and Ford set up parts dealerships all over the country, and by 1927 any American who wanted a Tin Lizzie already had one with 15 million Ford Model Ts sold. Good roads had followed the narrow ruts made in the mud by the Model T. The great automotive boom was on. As Ford's production was improving all the time, less waste, more spotters, straw bosses, stool pigeons, 15 minutes for lunch, 3 minutes to go to the toilet, the tailorized speed up everywhere, reach under, adjust washer, screw down bolt, shove in cotter pin, reach under, adjust washer, screw down bolt, reach under, adjust, screw down, reach under, adjust, until every ounce of life was sucked off into protection, and at night the workmen went home gray-shaking husks. Ford owned every detail of the process, from the ore in the hills until the car rolled off the end of the assembly line under its own power. The plants were rationalized to the last ten thousandth of an inch, as measured by the Johansson scale. In 1926, the production cycle was reduced to 81 hours, from the ore in the mine to the finished saleable car, proceeding under its own power. But the Model T was obsolete. <clears throat> New era prosperity and the American plan there were strings to it, always there were strings to it, had killed the Tin Lizzie, the big money, page 56 and 7. After the stock market crash in October of 1929, Governor Franklin Delano Roosevelt created the first welfare department for the state of New York, and those on relief were shunned by churches as wanting in virtue, and the more government tried to help the poor, the less private charity became available, since people assumed that the government was now taking care of the poor. There was no good way to distribute relief, and while workers were persecuted when they asked for higher wages, many people thought the poor should be sterilized. One man said that if every business hired just one new person, the depression would be over. But the businessmen said they had no right to use stockholders' money to hire people they didn't need. The serving class disappeared as people let their servants go in order to economize. 
and that added to the roles of the unemployed, and after the Depression, when money again became available to hire household help, there were few who could be found for hire. Before the Great War, half of all households employed at least one cook, two maids, and a driver handyman, but that class of people would vanish from America after the New Deal. The Great Depression saw long lines of men getting free soup in the cities, and these men were having the time of their lives far away from the boring farms with their endless peace, and in the cities the former farmers were surrounded by huge stately buildings that had mushroomed during the Roaring Twenties, while machines were doing the work for which these men were no longer needed. The lines of free men in the soup lines thanked God every day that they were living in the greatest country on earth, and those who traveled to look for work learned hobo symbols to mark the bum's easy trail, and they were still better off than before the ballooning of the stock market or the coming of the new farm machinery. Life here in town is too damn monotonous, working away at a regular job, all the time somebody bossin' and spottin' us. I'm not cut out for a regular job. Honest, I'm getting all feeble and rickety. Say, folks, I'd just as soon be in jail. It's us for the road and the old hobo way again. Clickety-click on the quivering rail. It's us for the road and the old hobo way again. Loafing around in the wind and the sun. Loving the night and the soft of the hay again, nary a worry or work to be done. Trampin's no cinch, but it's full of variety. Here we're just plodding and plodding around. It's us for the road and the wheels that go clickety, clickety click on the quivering rail. IWW folk song. The Depression moved people around in America, with men jumping on rail cars to seek their fame and fortune and Americans of African descent coming up from the South looking for work. And one out of nine people were out of work in what had become a depression. People had moved away from the farms into the cities, and trying to get them back onto private farms would be a complete failure, although the skills they had learned from growing up on farms would save the day when FDR finally sent them over to Europe to fight Hitler. Ford promoted victory gardens at the workplace during the Great Depression, and the authorities sent unemployed people to work on Ford's farms, and Henry Ford, Ford donated the labor and machinery that turned vacant lots into gardens, but it made the local farmers mad as Ford's vegetables depressed the price of their own produce, and in the face of what Ford saw as unchristian greed, he began directly donating food to the poor. Americans were getting by on their small family farms, <clears throat> but when the Democrats took over in 1933, the sharp increase in taxes made them suffer because all the government agencies born from the New Deal were expensive. People in the cities couldn't survive without government help, and somebody had to pay for that, and when enough people in the cities voted Democrat in 1933 to bring on what Hoover saw as dangerous socialism, with that socialism came imminent war with Europe because the bulk of FDR's budget was riding on Europe paying its debt accrued from the Great War. Before 1933, presidential candidates had to rely on their reputation, but like Hitler, the radio guaranteed the election of FDR, and to win the Democratic nomination to run against Hoover, FDR flew to Chicago in a Ford trimotor. Hoover received 41% of the popular vote with very few electoral votes, even though many states were lost by only a very small margin, and the Democrats won 60 out of 95 seats in the Senate and 310 out of 527 in the House. And when Hoover left the Oval, Oval Office, he went to Stanford University in California to create a library out of all the books and papers he had gathered from the countries that had fought in the Great War, and if Hoover had run with a wet vice president, he would have won the 1933 election. <laughs>
Britain had abandoned the gold standard in 1931, and foreign speculators had begun buying gold with paper dollars, so the Federal Reserve Bank released gold as collateral to banks for loans in the Glass-Steagall Act early in 1932, and that caused a sharp increase in the Dow, and Hoover believed that he could keep America on the gold standard, even though its gold reserves were going overseas. Hoover wanted banks operating across state lines, so he had forced them to join the Federal Reserve, and lawyers said that was unconstitutional, but Hoover got things going again, and the economy was on an upswing when the Bank of England completely failed, quote, despite fresh, heavy private loans from the United States and France, close quote. Communism, Fascism, and Democracy, The Theoretical Foundations by Carl Cohen, New York, Random House, 1962, page 251. The Glass-Steagall Act had passed for reasons of national defense, and Hoover thought the New Deal would turn Americans into Nazis because it catered to big business. And he knew that the New Deal was, quote, riddled with waste and political corruption, cost more, and aided fewer people each year, close quote, Ibid, page 328. Hoover had set up a private banking corporation authorized to lend out a billion dollars, <throat> but the people running it made unreasonable demands for collateral, and the money failed to leave the banks. So on the 7th of December in 1931, Hoover had created the Emergency Reconstruction Corporation, an agency of state capitalism funded at $2 billion that would later become the Reconstruction Finance Corporation with a shelf life of two years. And Hoover knew that the secret of capitalism was credit, and that if, if his ERC played Scrooge, there would be no Christmas in America. But the people running the ERC did not believe in Santa, and only wanted to save the banks by continuing to withhold loans. The ambassador to Great Britain was appointed the ERC's chairman, and the government was now in the business of doing business, and it would stay in business until after Hitler's war. Hoover urged them to make loans to farmers who had only their animals and future crops as collateral, and for two months after the birth of the ERC, bank failures dropped and the stock market rose, but it was short-lived, and many of the loans were made for only six months, not long enough for farmers to realize their crops. The interest rates were too stiff, while many new loans were made merely to pay back old loans, and the credit was far below the amount needed by the farmer. Congress took out the parts of Hoover's plan that made loans to farmers and to industry and to small towns, and then they adjourned for the Christmas holiday, and Hoover signed it on the 22nd of January in 1932, because it was better than nothing. When the ERC became the Reconstructive Reconstruction Finance Corporation in 1932 to stimulate the economy, Hoover loaned out a couple of billion dollars to banks and railroads and life insurance companies, but it all went where free money always goes, and the rest of the currency was being hidden in jars buried in people's backyards. People stopped spending, and currency stopped moving, and those who owned stocks started selling them for the cash they weren't collecting from customers, and these quick-sell underpriced stocks were quickly purchased, which raised the price of the stock again, and after one billion dollars of Hoover's ERC money disappeared, mobs marched on Washington shouting praises for Hitler, and then the stock market crashed again. Democrats began clamoring for welfare, and Hoover knew from experience that as soon as the government started passing out free food and funds, private charity would stop, and Hoover passed out 40 million bushels of wheat and asked the insurance companies to postpone mortgage collections, but they refused. So Hoover asked Congress to buy bank stock outright in order to save them, but again Congress refused. Hoover appointed a committee to investigate criminals in the stock market, most of whom turned out to be rich Republicans, and the Senate asked the brokers to come clean about any short selling they'd done in 1931, but no confessions were forthcoming. Hoover thought that FDR's plan to go off the gold standard was a bad idea, and Hoover thought the New Deal was dangerous, quote, with, quote, 
deficit finance, controlled prices, or direct relief, close quote. And Hoover's Quaker philosophy was about volunteering, and he knew that volunteers quit after the job was completed, but that government people paid to do the work would never let the job end. Hoover said that if you could drop a chart describing an organization, it was probably not working. FDR's New Deal would loan money to farmers to store surplus farm products, hoping it would sell at good prices when crops failed again, but the surpluses sat in the warehouses as farm production increased year after year, and the Agricultural Marketing Act, creating the Federal Farm Board, used up all the money Congress had to spare, but nobody was helped by it. The Agricultural Adjustment Administration said that only people who'd grown tobacco before that year were allowed to grow it anymore, and in 1940 they would change the law to acreage limits, so quality suffered for quantity, and American tobacco that had been the best in the world quickly became nothing worth hollering about. The interest rate on loans from banks was too low to compensate them for the depreciating dollar, and banks had to raise their rates to stay in business, and with rates raised, fewer loans were made. So FDR passed the Emergency Banking Act in 1934, and then the Economy Act, and he created the Federal Emergency Relief Administration and the National Recovery Administration, and FDR went ahead with Hoover's lending laws that had failed to pass Congress before. Hoover had created a plan for unemployment insurance and had proposed price controls and a wage standard that FDR adopted, and the FDIC guarantee on bank deposits and the Emergency Banking Act all came from Hoover, who had asked Americans to keep a family pig, but the closest they got was the AAA, the CCC, and the TVA. Hoover thought that the AAA was just like what was going on in Germany and that the CCC would become a paramilitary group just like the American Legion wanted to become. And most of all, Hoover warned that a bloated, overgrown government would sap the life out of America. Hoover reminded everyone that an unwieldy government had engineered the Great War, and that the Democrats would start another war simply because they didn't know how to stop it. <laughs>